sing. Welcome to SCF. We're so glad you've chosen to join us for service this morning. We want to welcome those worshiping with us at SCF Online. God bless. Feel free to like and share the service. Put your hand there and go like this. Come on, church, sing this with me.
God, we give you all our praise this morning. We turn our hearts towards you, Jesus. We thank you for your presence, that you're so available, that you're so close. We thank you for your peace, Jesus. And sing this with me. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break.
that fear for Jesus. There is no other name are so grateful that the creator of the universe has called us sons and daughters. We're your children, not slaves to fear, but children of the Most High. There's no good thing will you withhold from us. Whatever we're facing, God, we are so grateful that 
you're bigger than it all you're not bigger than we imagine you're bigger than we can imagine high above it all so God we come to you God we come to your word we come into your house we lift our voices wanting you to speak to us God there are people in this room struggling with fear and anxiety and we can lay it at the foot of the cross and find peace in Jesus name so God, meet us here in this moment. Meet us in this room. As we do every week, we want to leave changed. Speak to us this morning, Father, through your word. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And in one loud FCF voice, we all said? And we all said? And I want you to give a high five to somebody worship and say, I'm a child of God. And if you're not, you can be before you leave this room. It's going to be a fantastic morning. Well, good morning. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning, especially if it is your first time. Can we take a second and welcome our first time guests? That's awesome. And if it's your second time, let's welcome our second time guests. Yeah. If it's your 42nd time here, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We are so glad that you are here this morning. If it is your first time, we would love it if you would take a second and fill out the connect card on the worship guide you got when you came in, or you can go to fcfchurch.com and just tap connect. It'll help us get to know you a little better. And you were probably given that worship guide when you came in this door by the youth, the youth takeovers today. Let's give it up for the youth. There they are. So amazing to have the youth engaged, our high school students here in the service, worshiping together and with all of us as a church body. Great things happening in the youth ministry here. Make sure to check it out Tuesday nights at 6.30. We also have, yeah, woo. We also have, uh, we also have Discover FCF coming up on May the 5th after Sunday service, after the second service in the North Building. There's food. We've got a free meal for you. It's a great way. If you're new here, you can get to know a little bit more about FCF Church, know our mission, our vision, our values, and just get a little bit more connected here into this church. If you would like to learn more about what we're doing here and the great things happening at FCF Church, we invite you to sign up for Discover FCF at fcfchurch.com slash events. And Dylan's our young adult leader. Him and his wife, Bethany, do an amazing job with that ministry. And that's Thursday nights. Seven Thursdays at seven, and yeah, he's a good egg, a little cracked, but he's a good egg. So, and while we're just welcoming people, how about we welcome back our Peru mission team? I want to see if I can remember. They did. I understand they did a whole lot of painting, kind of like two stories worth of painting. They repaired a lot of furniture, and they did some children's ministry on top of that. And then they visited two of the churches that we previously did construction at. We helped with the actual physical construction of two other churches in years past. They visited those. So welcome back to this amazing team. We thank them. Yeah, you go. Okay. Well, they're the ones there making the trip in another way, we're all there. Uh, we thank you because when you partner and give to FCF Church, you are helping other churches around the world that we are partnering with. In Mark, Jesus, Mark's gospel, Jesus said this. He says, go to all people everywhere in the world, tell God's good news to everyone. So we as a church, we are focused here on our little corner of the world, the Frederick County area and around this community. We are seeking to share the good news, but at the same time, we are partnering with other churches and organizations in other places around the world, like, the, like Peru, where they are seeking in their little community to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So every time when you give to FCF Church, you are giving and partnering with these other places around the world so that we can reach the entire world with the good news of Jesus Christ. So if you want to give to the great things that God is doing in and through FCF Church and all around the world, we invite you to give on our website or on the app or utilizing those offering boxes. Pastor Randy is going to continue on this awesome series, Words Every Soul Wants to Hear.
wonder if you can remember the first time that you were introduced to fear. I mean, most of us, it's in our childhood. You might be able to go back even, you know, at this time in your life, and you might remember, yeah, I remember the first time I really experienced fear. Uh, I, I can remember it very distinctly. I was six years old, and fear to me came in the form of a, a little bitty 25-year-old woman. Now, I didn't know who she was initially. Uh, I had been brought up by my great-grandfather and great-grandmother, and suddenly this lady that lived upstairs in our apartment building was introduced to me. She was just a kid herself, 25, and it turned out she was my mother. Now, I didn't even have a word for mother. I, I knew nanny and daddy, my great-grandmother and great-grandfather, but I was told I had to go live with this woman, this stranger, and it was terrifying. I, I mean, I didn't even understand. I couldn't unravel it, but that was just the beginning. That little lady introduced me to fear in a way that I never thought possible. Soon she took me away to an apartment. We lived in southeast Washington, and night after night, her and her drunken boyfriends would end up arguing, fighting. I would awaken many, many nights to bodies being slammed around, punches being thrown, run out of the house in my underwear, just not even knowing where to go, what to do. That was my introduction to fear. It was far from <laughs> the last. It, you know, things went on in life, but I wonder if you can remember your introduction to fear. Now, I'm going to just be frank with you this morning. I'm just speaking kind of from my heart about this. I don't know what your thought is about fear. Most of us, we kind of deal with fear similar. We feel like, you know, you can't control most things in life. I can only control a few things. I'm going to take my risk. I'm going I'm to figure that, you know, statistically speaking, I'm not likely to be struck by lightning or things like that. So I'm going to go on and live my life because that's the best thing you can do. But here, here's the deal with me. I'm going to just tell you my bias. I absolutely hate fear. I, I have lived with fear in a way that I can't quite explain. Now, we all deal with it. You know, I dealt with it in a lot of different ways and still do, I suppose. But I hate it. I hate the feeling of fear. I hate the thoughts that accompany fear. I, I, I hate the thought that human beings all over the world, kids all over the world, have to live with fear. If you and I were, instead of being here, living in a certain other part of the world geographically, we would have to be in great fear for any number of circumstances. I think it's lousy that human beings have to live in fear. Right now, in this audience, if we're going to be honest, you all have various levels of fear some of which are very personal to you you keep them as secretive as you can it might be financial fears that you have it might be relational fears it might be very personal you might feel like i'll never be adequate i'll never be like for my real self i'll never be loved you might fear crime you might fear war you might fear accidents you might fear disease you know we're all just a bad doctor's report away from our lives suddenly becoming quite fragile Fear. What, what is your central fear? What, what are the fears you struggle with? Some of us, the truth be told, just being in a room like this with this many people can create some fears, rational or irrational. It doesn't matter. They're real. Some of you are afraid of spiders, and you know it might seem not, not a big deal to me, but it's a big deal to you. Fear is a lousy emotion. Now, I know some of you are thinking, but Randy, fear... Fear helps protect us, and yes, that, that's true. You walk out your door, and there's a rhinoceros standing in, in your driveway. Get back in the house, because you can't outrun him. He's three to 4,000 pounds, but he can run 30 miles an hour. You can't. Uh, Usain Bolt can only run 23.4. You can't outrun Mr. Hippo. He may look cute and roly-poly. He's dangerous. <laughs> so fear does protect us to a certain point, but it's not an enjoyable emotion so we're in a series called this it's called words every soul wants to hear and I believe with all my heart that there are certain words that because you're human and I'm human because you were made by Christ and for him because you were made in the image of God with the capacity to experience life like God himself experiences it that there are certain words that you and I as human beings want to hear from our Creator. We need to hear them from our Creator because, frankly, even though we might try to say them to one another, they don't really carry the weight 
because we know as well-intentioned as we may be, I can't always fulfill what I might promise you. I might say to someone, you don't have to be afraid. And maybe for that moment, maybe in that tiny circumstance, I can really fulfill that. But I can't say that across the board. I can't tell another human being, you don't have to be afraid because I can't do what it takes so that they don't have to be afraid. And that's where we're at today. You don't have to be afraid. I want to hear and you need to hear, and we all need to hear from our Creator, say to us in a comprehensive way, everything is different now. You don't have to be afraid, meaning fear is not going to exist anymore. The Bible promises that. God promises that. Fear is, is here just for a short time. It is a short shelf life. It's going to be abolished ultimately. And God wants to say these words to us now so that we can internalize them, count on them while we have to continue to live in a time where fear is a reality. And we're all going to struggle with it on different levels. In the book of Isaiah 43, it says, Now this is what the Lord says, Do not be afraid. Why? Because I've reclaimed you, I've called you by name, you're mine. Now, when these words were first said by Isaiah the prophet, it was 712 B.C., <laughs> and it was at a time where there was every reason to be afraid. Just 10 years earlier, the Assyrian Empire had overrun Israel. Israel was broken up into 12 tribes, just like we have 50 states. Well, they had like 12 states. Ten of those tribes had been swept away by the Assyrians. They were taken and dispersed to other nations that the Assyrians had captured and conquered. They were never returned to Israel. They're called the Ten Lost Tribes. Within 126 years of this statement, the Babylonians would come and overrun Israel and take them into captivity for 70 years. Now, my point is just this. God says to them, he says, you, you don't have to be afraid, but if I'm an Israelite, I'm thinking, I have every reason to be afraid. I saw what just happened 10 years earlier, and of course, Isaiah was predicting what was going to happen later on with the Babylonians. So, so what is God getting at? Well, well the key are these things. He says, I, I, I've reclaimed you. He's talking to people whose trust he has regained, whose trust he has won, who have returned to God. And he says, you're, you're mine now. You're mine. This thing is going to end well. You're mine. So you don't, get this accent, you don't have to be afraid. You can be, and you will be at times, but you ultimately don't have to be. It's going to end well for you because you're mine. I've reclaimed you. I've won you back to my trust, and it's going to end well for you is what he's saying. So let's ask a question to open up. Why, why, do, we, why, do, we, why do we endlessly encounter fear? I mean, you go anywhere. You could be going down the highway, and suddenly you see a car leave its lane and come over. The next thing you know, you know you're in trouble. Any any time we walk out the door, we can encounter fear. Where did it all start? Where did where did fear come into existence? The Bible teaches there was a time where fear did not exist, where human beings lived their lives every day. We don't know how long, and fear, the very emotion, the feeling, the thought, it didn't exist. Stop for a moment and picture what your life would be like if you had zero fear. Now, I'm not advocating that because that would be dangerous for you in this present world. But I'm just saying how different your life would be. So why do we endlessly encounter fear? Well, we have to go back to Genesis 3. I, I often say this, that you cannot understand life. You cannot understand what's going on in the world who you are, why you are as you are, and you can't understand the Bible. You won't understand the whole rest of the Bible unless you thoroughly understand and digest Genesis chapter 3. Everything changes there. Christians treat it, I, I think, too, too simplistically, and we don't understand the depths of what's really going on there. So let me just take you back. We can't go into it too de deeply, but a little bit. It says, then the man and his wife heard the sound. Now, this is after they had been tempted by Satan to eat of the tree, the one tree that God had forbidden. They, excuse, is there a, a device going off or something there? I keep hearing something talking. No? Okay. Um, after they had eaten of the tree that God had asked them not to eat of, they had broken trust with God. 
Satan had slandered the character of God, said that God has lied to you. If you eat of the tree, you won't die. If you eat of the tree, you'll, you'll be like God yourself. You'll be better than you are. You'll have the highest quality of life feasible. So he slanders God. They eat of the tree. They break trust with God. And here we're getting the results. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was, what does it say? Afraid. This is the first time fear came into existence. But it came into existence because mankind had stopped trusting in their creator. And so now, instead of running toward their creator, which they had likely done before this, they're, they're running away. They hid. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. It goes on. And the Lord God said, and this is after the fact, he said, the Lord God said, now the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and do what? Live how long? Forever. So God is banishing mankind in a sinful, distrusting state from being able to live forever eternal life uh, immortality it's a conditional gift god gives it we don't have it innately we don't have it intrinsically we're not born with a an eternal spirit an eternal soul i know that's taught some places but that's not true god can conditionally give us immortality but they're they're cast out so that they won't live forever and it says so the lord god banished man from the garden of eden now, you and I weren't born in the Garden of Eden in a place where there was paradise and beauty and, and it was safe and sound and God was present and we could see him with our eyes and hear him with ears. No, we, we were born to the Garden of Evil. From your birth and my birth, we have existed in a world where evil is present. And because evil is present, fear is the product of that. So I'm going to take you really quickly through some dynamics from that passage. The foundational dynamics of fear are this. First, Adam and Eve were distracted from God. When you read the passage thoroughly, all the verses, Satan gets their attention away from God. They're not close to God, and they get distracted, and they start listening to things maybe they shouldn't have listened to. Disregard for God's word. The, the uh, adversary says, oh, did God really say that you shouldn't touch the tree and that kind of thing? So they were dis had disregard for God's word, then ultimately distrust, and then they detached from God disobedience to God and then distance from God now that history is pretty much the history of every one of us in this room we may not have the clarity because maybe you say I was brought up in a Christian home Randy and I knew about the Lord from the time I was just a little bitty kid okay but that's not true of most of us and so this this break with God is what is at the root of fear because he is the only one that can really give us the kind of circumstances necessary so that, that fear wouldn't be a necessity. Now, when you think about the reasons, if we ask ourselves the question, what, what would have to happen? I mean, if, if right now we could do something or someone could do something to make it where there would be no reason to fear in society for anyone anywhere, what are some things that would have to happen? Well, let me ask you a question. If I had all my worldly goods, my, my, everything that I value, I unload my 401k, it's not a whole lot in it, but anyway, I, everything I have, all the money in my bank, and I put it in a little room in my house, and you're staying there at my house. You're, Bruce, you're staying there at my house. And so you know, man, all my worldly goods, all my much value is right there. You know, my, my millions of dollars are right there. <laughs> and I said, Bruce, now look, man, I'm going to go away for a week, and uh, do I need to put a lock on this? or in my safe what are you going to tell me you, yeah he says you're safe how many of you if I had all my values in that room and I say to you do I need to put a lock on this or, or is it safe how many of you would say man, you, man your money's safe with me Randy can I see your hands okay not, not all of you but most of you it's okay <laughs> I appreciate your honesty <laughs> so what if, what if I said, I'm going to have 100 people stay at my house, and, and out of the 100, I know for a fact, eight of them are committed thieves. They're not just thieves, they're committed to thievery. <laughs> you say, why, why, why eight out of 100, Randy? Well, well, 
all the felonies done in the United States are done by 8% of the population. They sure can cause some havoc, though, can't they? So, so now, now I have a situation. I got 100 people staying at my house. I got all my valuables in the room, and I say to a whole 100, you know, what do you think? But I know eight of them are committed thieves. How many of you would suggest, Randy, you need to lock the room? Can I see your hands? Lock the room, Randy? Yes. <laughs> so here's what I'm getting at. For there to be no reason for you and I to fear, we would have to have a major, radical societal change. Literally, every human being would have to become trustworthy all the time. It, it, is, it is impossible for us to live in a world that is fearless or without fear because of the condition of human beings, human hearts. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 3. It says, as it is written, there is no one, what? Righteous. Not me, not you, not the Pope, not the Pip, not anybody. No one righteous, not even one. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. All have sinned, and we kind of fixate on that. Yeah, man, we're all guilty. We've sinned, man. God's ticked at us. He's mad. It's not what it's really saying. It's the second part that we need to focus on. All have sinned, and you tell me what it says. Fall short of the glory of God. But what does that mean? It means I, you, we were made to live the way God himself lives and to love the way God himself loves. When it says we fall short of the glory, it means we're not living at the standard that God himself lives. If we all did, the world would be safe. There would be no need for fear. So to get the world to a place where there would be no reason to fear, we've got to make major societal changes. And you and I both know that's not happening. Now, now, there's a second part before we could live in this world fearless. I, I mean, we're, we're all different here, man. So, so, like, some of you, you're like Tarzan feet. You can walk on gravel. You can walk on hot coals. How, how many, you, you'll own up to it. Yeah, man, I, I got Tarzan feet. I can walk on glass. Can I see your hands? Nobody wants to admit to Tarzan feet. <laughs> but some of you have sissy feet like me. If I get on the beach... And that sand is hot, I'll run right under your umbrella. You're a stranger, I might kick some sand on you even, and I'll beg your forgiveness. But my feet are hot and burning, I'm going to get it. So what's my point? Not only would society have to change before there would be no reason for fear, I have to change physically. You have to change physically. I am too vulnerable. I am too easily damaged. You are too easily damaged. And it's not just physical. It's mental, emotional, and spiritual. But, but let's just fixate on the physical. So here's my point. Before we could live truly, in, intelligently fearless, society would have to change, but I would have to change. I would have to become invulnerable physically. Otherwise, I should fear. There are things that can hurt me. So these are massive changes that would have to occur. Now, I want to give you a little, little, little picture here of what we're looking at. The elimination of fear requires the abolition of evil and immortalization of humanity. In other words, until God changes my physiology where you can't hurt me physically, I have reason to fear. Until my mind, reason, emotions, will, and spirituality, until those are in a condition where uh, they can't be hurt, then, then I have reason to fear. So... Evil, sin and evil, brings what? What is the word? Danger. You and I live in a dangerous world, and we have to accept that as reality. And danger produces what? Fear. Because fear at least keeps us alive for the little bit of time that we have. So this is the cycle we need to understand. Now, I'm going to add one more reason for fear and again it's a reason that only God can deal with it's only God that can change society the way we're talking about the elimination the abolition of evil which abolishes the reasons for danger and it's only God that can bring immortalization to our bodies so that they are indestructible I, I kind of believe Adam and Eve before they sinned probably had bodies that were impossible to damage 
it, it seems only after they, they became aware that they're now vulnerable and so forth. When we depart from the will of God, we are vulnerable. Anyway, let me go on. Sin, evil, danger, fear. Proverbs 28 brings a whole different kind of fear, though. It says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. What, what does that mean? The wicked Randy, I know some wicked people, and man, they're, they're nasty. They're bold as a lion. They don't run from anybody. What is this talking about? The wicked flee when no one pursues. Can you remember back when you first violated something that a parent or a guardian told you? You know, you, you broke a rule. You told your first lie. Can you remember back at how uncomfortable you were, how afraid you were? This is talking about guilt. This is talking about when we live discordant with the way God designed us. We were meant to live like God lives, love like he loves. When we sin, which is living contrary to the laws of our being, whether we know it or not, it brings this discomfort inside. We, we have varying degrees of guilt and shame, and they bring fear. The person that is guilty... And the person that feels shame is always a little bit afraid. Now, they may, com they may combat the fear with aggression. They, they may get really mean and really violent, but they're, they're struggling because inside they're scared all the time. They feel uncomfortable in their own skin. A lot of people plunge into addiction for the same reason. So that's what it's talking about. The wicked flee when no one's pursuing but the righteous are as bold as a lion. When our conscience is clear, when we're living our life aligned with God's will and his word, living the way he lives, loving the way he loves, we have a, a kind of a boldness about us. So here is a level of fear that only God can deal with. I can't cope with this. I can't make up for things I've done in the past. I can't do things to my conscience and my memory to rid myself of the feelings of guilt and shame only God can do that um, the, the greatest therapist in the world can't do that the best drugs in the world can't do that I have to go back to my creator and I have to see that he is loving and forgiving and promises me pledges to me says to me that there is forgiveness for whatever I have done. There's no other answer. I can't make up for it. You can't make up for it. But until we receive our Creator's forgiveness, we're going to live with some fear. We're going to have some internal discomfort in our souls, and it manifests itself in all kinds of ways. So this kind of gives us this trail of how do we get into this world where everybody's afraid. Every, how, is there anybody here that doesn't have a lock on their door? You have no locks on your door. No, because we have a little bit of fear. All right, so we can see that evil has brought danger, and danger brings fear. And until these things are completely resolved, we will always have some fear. So the question comes, what is God saying then when he says, you don't have to be afraid? Because that's where we started in Isaiah. He's telling the Israelites, you don't have to be afraid. And now I've just showed you, yeah, you do have to be afraid. There is great reason to be afraid as long as the evil is existent and as long as I'm in a mortal, vulnerable state. So, you know, what, what is the meaning of God's word in this case? How many of you, I'm just going to ask a question. I, I'm not trying to intrude in your life or anything, but how many of you have ever had a significant car accident? Can I see your hands? Okay. Okay. And, and, and yet... You that just raised your hand as you were in a significant car accident, are, are you still driving? You're still driving. When, when you first had the significant accident, were you kind of kind of a little scared the first time you got behind the wheel, a little shaky? How many identify with that one? Can I see your hands? Yeah. I, I was, uh, I guess it was about 10, 12 years ago. I was coming into work one morning, and I was driving the champagne shark, man. The champ I got a picture of the champagne shark. See that nose there? Doesn't it? Doesn't it look like a shark? That's why I bought it. I love that car. Chrysler Concorde. It was used, but it was new to me. So I'm driving in in the Champagne Shark, and the next thing I know, this fellow, he's beside me on the overpass right there by Mountain Gate. Mountain Gate, the only place in Frederick that I know of that for a very little bit of money you can eat sinfully and get to the place where you, you're, you're begging God for mercy. But <laughs> so he's the, the guy that I can trust, man. You know, this is his job. He's the, 
the prince of the highway, the truck driver. So we're right beside each other on that overpass. And I have no idea what went in his mind. He came right over. And my shark, the nose of the shark, went right under here. And he and I, we're spinning now. We're spinning. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little disoriented. Airbags don't punch me in the face. And everything's a little disoriented. So finally we come clean. And I'm spinning, and I'm right across Route 15, horizontal. I'm blocking both lanes. And I feel like, oh, at least I'm alive, you know. And I look up, and here comes my man. He's spinning around like this, and I realize his rear end is going to broadside me right, right on my side of the door. You know what happened? The light lights blinding white lights came on inside my car that chrysler concord the champagne shark and i heard a voice said randy <laughs> yes lord <laughs> you will live and not die no that's not what happened <laughs> you want to know what went through my mind i'll be straight with you I first felt relieved because I was not spinning anymore, and then I see my man's going to hit me, blurred side. I'm like, I th here's the thought. Lord, I never thought I was going to go this way. <laughs> Wham! And that was it. And then I realized after he hit me, wait a minute, I'm still breathing. <laughs> I'm still alive. Okay, so my point, I'm leading up to something. There is a way that we can effectively encounter fear while we're waiting for God to eliminate all reason for fear. And this process that many of us have been through is kind of a little bit of, of the evidence. It's kind of a little bit of the way. So let me, let me open this up for you in a, a passage of Scripture. Isaiah 41, once again, it says, So do not fear. Why? Why should I not fear? There's plenty to fear. Why should I not fear? What does it say? I am with you. When I was going through that accident... The entire time I had a sense of God's presence. Was I afraid simultaneously? Yes. But I had a sense of his presence. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. Why should I fear? I will strengthen you, and I'll do what else? Help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is the promise of God to those who have returned to him in trust, those that have put their trust in Christ and are followers of Christ. This is God's promise to us. Until your mission in this life is over, until your work is done, until your journey is completed, and your times, my times, are in God's hands. They're not in the truck's hands. They're not in the disease's hands. They're in God's hands. But there is a start and there is a stop unless we live into the return of Christ. Until then... Here's God's promise to us. Here's how we effectively encounter fear. We're going to encounter danger, and that means we're going to encounter fear. And we have to have that, that realization, uh, no matter what I go through, no matter where I'm at, no matter how alone I may feel, no matter how frightened I may be, God is with me. Now, I urged you in an earlier message in, in this series, the very first message, there is something I urge called practicing the presence of God until the presence of God is impossible for you not to be aware of. You and I were meant to be God carriers. We were meant to be indwelt by God. My mind, your mind, your spirit, my spirit were meant to live united with God. There shouldn't be a time that I'm ever unaware of his presence. I can function, I can carry out my duties, but I know he's there. I know he's with me as much as I know my own conscious awareness is there. If you're not at that stage yet, start reminding yourself. In the morning, get up and say, Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me. Maybe at lunchtime, you repeat it again. Maybe at dinner time, repeat it again. Maybe before you go to sleep until it becomes something that's conscious. I'm with you. That makes a difference to know that God is with me in whatever circumstance I'm in, no matter how frightened I might be. And he'll strengthen me, and he'll help me, and he'll uphold me unless it's time for my mission to end in which case he promises he'll receive me to himself. To be absent from the body, it says, is to be present with the Lord. I don't believe there'll be any unconscious state. We might look physically unconscious, but our spirit will go from this estate to the very presence of conscious, uh, consciously being in the presence of God according to what he promises in his word. How many remember the story of Stephen, the first Christian martyr? Remember he was being stoned to death, and, and just prior to his death, he says, Lord, 
I see you. He says, I see the heavens open and the Lord standing. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So as his spirit was leaving his body, he was already conscious of the presence of Christ in a palpable way. All right, let's, let's look on a little further. Psalm 56 says this, when, when, the, the key word there is when, because now we're looking, the first, the first part we were looking at God's presence and God's promises. I'm with you, that's his presence, and I'll uphold you, and I'll help you, and so forth. Now, now we're looking at something a little different. It's a process when I'm actually experiencing fear. When I am, what does it say? Afraid. Doesn't say if I'm going to be afraid. We're going to experience fear. When I am afraid, I put my trust where? In you. When a, when a truck was about to whip, whip around and hit me broadside, I said, Lord, I didn't think I, my life was going to end like this. You know, I was essentially expressing trust, though I was afraid. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust and I am not, what does it say? Afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? I can tell you what they can do. They can steal, kill, and destroy. They can break your heart, break your home, take everything you have, and kill you. But Jesus rose from the grave, and he said that we shouldn't have any fear of those that can only kill the body but can't do anything to our souls. He promises those that have trust in him, though we are dead, yet we will live. And so that's why God says things like this to us. What, what can mere mortals do to me? Well, they can do stuff, but they can't extinguish your existence. Now, I, I wanted to peep over that veil. Wouldn't you like to peep over the veil and see the other side? I think I'd be a lot more bold. But God says, no, you're just going to have to trust me. The other side's there. It's waiting, but you're going to have to trust me. So here's a process. When I am afraid, i got to say, you know what? I'm feeling my fear. I, it's real. I am scared of what's about or what might happen. But I'm going to put my trust in God. I'm either going to survive it or I'm not. And if I get damaged, I'm going to, I'm going to trust him to get me restored, to get me healthy, to heal me. Uh, whatever it is, if, if my heart gets broken, I'm going to trust him to heal it. We said that in an earlier message. Whatever it is, I'm going to, in the process of feeling the fear, you and I have to stop and say, okay, the fear is real, but I'm going to put my trust in God. He's with me. He's for me. He loves me. And he can deliver me if he chooses to. And if he chooses not to deliver me, he will go through this with me and bring me through the fire and, and I will still be okay. And even better if I cling to him after going through it. That's what we have to remind ourselves of though when we get in those situations that really can be very difficult and terrifying. Psalm 34 adds to this process. He says, I sought the Lord and he answered me, and he did what? Delivered me from all my fears. Now think about this. This is by David, a man who experienced a lot of ups and downs in life, a lot of hardships in life. He's saying, first of all, what's the process? I sought the Lord. Now you read about David and read his life. He sought the Lord in every kind of experience in life. He sought the Lord when things were good. He sought the, things, uh, sought the Lord when things were bad and everything in between. So he's talking about a process. If I am one that as a, as a kind of an anchor to my life, I seek God. I seek his word. I seek his will. I live for him. I, I, I really believe that sanity is living the way that God created me to live and in union with him. So I'm seeking the Lord. I'm not just seeking you know, a ticket that when life ends, make sure my, my elevator goes up instead of down. That, that's nonsense. I mean, God, God is an authentically relational being, and he wants an authentic relationship with those who are willing to trust him. But he says, he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Now, delivered me from all my fears is a process. Evidently, David went through the fears. Evidently, David experienced the fears. Evidently, David had to step into and live through Live through some of those fears, just like you lived through that significant car accident, but then you got back behind the wheel. Process, process. Sometimes going through the fears is the way that God delivers us from fear. I'm just curious. How many of you in here can say, you know, Randy, yeah, I got you on that one, man. I can think back. There's some stuff. I didn't want to go through it. I was trying to avoid it, but I, I ended up having to go through it anyway. 
and I was scared and, and, and it really was bothersome to me but somehow I went through it because I couldn't get out of it and when I came through it that same circumstance didn't quite scare me as much as what it did before I went through it how many can identify with that yeah that's part of the process where God in this time frame where he's not entirely abolishing all reason for fear he's still saying to us you don't have to be you can be afraid if you choose to but you don't have to be afraid is what we read in Isaiah and we read through the Bible now there's a there's a last point about this when we are willing to encounter fear the way that God urges us to we can actually experience his power but his power his power doesn't come through the way most people think most people think like when God's empowering you you suddenly feel this rush of vigor and you're just bold as a lion and you feel no fear and all like that way well, yeah that might be for some but evidence is that's not the way God's power tends to work his power tends to work when you and I feel weakest just let that sink in for a minute it means when you and I feel least comfortable is when his power tends to work now we know that that the the man that is probably the the greatest servant of God that ever lived is a man named the apostle Paul the spirit of God used him to write 13 books of our new testament I want to read you something he said biographically about himself when he went to the city of Corinth to share Christ with the people in the city of Corinth here's the condition he was in here we go when I came to you he's writing to the Corinthians when I came to you I was weak and what was he very afraid you're not just afraid very afraid this is a guy read 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 through 31 and you'll see this was a man who had been through some experiences but he says when I came to you I was very afraid and what trembling he's literally trembling have you ever you ever gotten in a situation where you're about to talk to somebody about your relationship with Christ or you're about to talk to them about their relationship with Christ and, and, and all of a sudden man your heart starts racing and you get a, you get a little nervous and you're getting a little sweaty how many of you, 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 you know you want to say something about Christ you know you want to talk to them about God but man you start getting tense and you start getting fear how many know what I'm talking about you've ever experienced it okay you're just like the apostle Paul Paul sounded worse he said I was literally trembling but he still shared the truth about God and the truth about life with the Corinthians and many of the Corinthians turned to Christ so this power of God this power of God came through touched the Corinthians changed many of their lives but all Paul felt was scared and weak he didn't feel the power of God but he concluded this in Philippians 4 after many experiences with God he's in, he's in jail when he writes this he says I can do all things through Christ who what strengthens me now where am I going with this the way we can effectively encounter fear today is we must be willing to feel the fear and still do the will of God in the circumstances that we're in in other words I'm going to feel the fear but the fear is not going to paralyze me it's not going to chain me it's not going to stop me from doing the will of God I'm going to do the will of God no matter how scared I am and that's where the power of God demonstrates itself God enables us to do his will to open these mouths of ours if that's the circumstance and share Christ with someone else but there's lots of other areas it takes courage it takes courage to be a servant the way God wants us to serve to give the way God wants us to give to love the way God wants us to love to be open and available to people I mean there's all kinds of areas that we get afraid to you know do what God says but you have to understand part of the process is we're still going to feel the fear but we have the power to do what is right in the sight of God that's what it's talking about that's part of the process let me wind this up for you 
effectively encountering fear of God's way, it calls for awareness of God's presence. That was that first Isaiah verse we read. Reliance on God's promises. He said, I'll be with you. I'll uphold you. I'll help you. Embracing God's process as he delivers us from our fears, often by allowing us to go through the fears, but accompanying us, strengthening us. And then we experience God's power. Now, the more we experience God's power when we're afraid, the more confident in God, the more bold we become to do his will. Now, I could ask you guys, but I, but I know many of you in here, you can look back at your Christian journey. When you first trusted in Christ, you were a little bit afraid to put certain parts of God's word uh, into action in your life. But then as you trusted God and obeyed him, you got a little bit bolder and a little bit bolder. And now things that you once were afraid to do you do quite spontaneously and quite comfortably even joyfully because you've walked through God's process so the spirit of God is here today wanting to at least free each of us a little bit further from being bound being controlled being tormented being paralyzed by fear now, we're awaiting the day when God will remove all reason for fear, and he promises us that. He says he's creating a new heaven and a new earth, and there's not going to be any more sin, sorrow, sickness, death, or pain ever again. Read it on your own in Revelation chapter 21, verses uh, 3 through 5. But God has been trying to speak to us in this series, and, and, and I want to just backtrack a bit. Here, here's what he first told us. God wants us to know every day of our life, every experience of our life, he wants us to know, I need to know, I need to hear, you need to hear from God. I will always love you. The second thing he wants us to hear is this, I will never forsake you. We heard that last week. I always love you, I'll never forsake you. And now he wants us to hear this, you don't have to be afraid. Put that together one time. I'll always love you, put your name in there. I'll never forsake you, put your name in there. You don't have to be afraid. We might be afraid, but we don't have to be. We don't have to be. The Spirit of God wants to, to, to kind of break through some barriers in this series in our lives and help us to recognize that, that we, we really do need closeness with our Creator. That, that's, that's normal for a human being. That's who we really are. That's our design. That's our nature. And apart from Him, we're really never fully human and never fully alive. Spirituality of this kind you know being united with God in Christ it's not just for those people that are kind of interested in those things it's for every human being it is your nature it is your calling so I hope today each of us will walk out of here just a little bit less fearful and a little bit more confident in God and a little bit more bold to actually do his will now we all know there's certain areas in our lives where maybe we've been afraid to do God's will so I hope that each of us will say you know this is the day I'm, I'm going to make a decision that I'm going to be confident in God and I'm not going to let fear hold me anymore from doing the will of God in this area of my life let's pray Father th these words we need we're like a bunch of scared vulnerable children that's who we really are we need your mercy. We need your kindness. We need assurance of your love. We need your forgiveness. We need to know you'll never forsake us. We need to know you're not angry at us. You're not disgusted with us. We need to know that you promise someday we will never have to fear again, anything ever again. May your spirit start to free us this morning from those unnecessary fears that we'll, we'll do your will and manifest your life before the circle of influence you've placed us in. We ask your power to do this in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand to your feet. Let's focus our hearts on that. Come on, sing it. I'm no longer a slave to your feet. Lift your voices. I'm no longer a slave.
for some of you in this room, as Pastor Randy was talking about what it means to be a child of God, that we don't have to be afraid. He'll never forsake us. He'll never leave us. For you, that whole concept, it just seems so foreign. Either that's not the God you have been taught or come to believe, but that is who He is. Amen, church? That's who He is. So one more time. We're going to sing this one more time. And if that's you this morning, I just want you to close your eyes. And I want you to picture your, your heavenly Father singing this song. You're no longer a slave to fear. You're a child of God. Come on, sing it together. I'm no longer a slave. Come on, He's called you His child, His son, His daughter. I'm a child. You love us, God. I'm no longer a slave. Just the voices sing it out. I'm no longer a slave to fear. This child. We're so honored that you've chosen to join us for service. Before you go, before you go, a reminder about the women's retreat. You can sign up online, fcfchurch.com forward slash events. If this is your first time with us, can we let our first time guests know how much we love them? Appreciate you being here with us. It's our privilege and honor to host you. Pastor Randy, myself, be over here on the left side of the stage. We'd love to shake your hand, answer any questions you have about the church. Maybe as Pastor Randy was talking about, you don't have to fear, you don't have to be alone. You would like someone to join you on your faith journey. Prayer Central is open and we would love to pray with you. We love you, FCF. Have an amazing week. Ladies, we'll see you on Friday. It's gonna be a great time. God bless.